back. We're live. We're here. <laughs> it's a 12 o'clock rock on a given Thursday. We are so excited to be uh, talking to people from um, uh, uh, the Priory. The Priory, what is it called? The Priory School for Girls. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And um, we have two teachers. We have I Hirasuna, science instructor, and we have Yasmin Saban, who's a technology, a math and technology instructor. Is there a difference? Uh, <laughs> depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> say hi, you guys. Say, say hi to everybody. Hello, hi. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> science and technology, you know, I, I mean, the Priory, uh, St. Andrew's Priory School for, for Girls and all that isn't necessarily known for science. You're, you're a new item, or am I wrong? I think I going to go ahead and take this one away. I would say that we actually are known for science. Um, a lot of our graduates do really well in STEM fields. Um, they go on to major in STEM in college, and I feel like they're very prepared for that. Yeah. And we recently just had a couple of students. Exactly. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to ISEF last week, which stands for International Science and Engineering Fair. Of course. Yeah, and um, actually I was there because I chaperoned two of our students. Um, and they competed in environmental engineering, which is one of the biggest categories there. And the thing is, they placed second. And this Not is 1,700 yeah. students yeah. from all over the world. So, I yeah, I, I think that they have the tools to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just reminded me, actually. <clears throat> you know, Think Tech covers the science fair every year. We go down there and we oh, take pictures. Okay. And it was yeah. like, I want to say, three years ago. There was a young girl, Chinese from Taiwan, mm -hmm. who was in your school, and she was brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, can I say that again? And, <laughs> and brilliant. And she was working on triangles. Yep. You remember this? You, did you know her? I was teaching at the time, but I heard, yes. Yeah, so she pretty much proved something in high school that people have been working to prove. And she was just like, hey, let's just do a science fair project on this. Like, this is cool. <laughs> Played around with it. I didn't actually get to read the research, but I mean, it's almost because I was too intimidated. I was like, oh, should she just take my job right away? Like, what do I do? So she came up with an entirely new yeah. theorem. Yeah, or exactly. Proof. Just worked through the like, relationship oh, wow. between triangles and was just like, hey, cool, this is what I did on a you know, Saturday night. Cool. <laughs> she like, was yeah. so happy yeah. about it. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, it would be too. It was amazing. Yeah. They named the triangle after, yeah. after her, yeah, you know. Oh my God. It's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. We do, amazing. so yeah, so maybe the word isn't necessarily spread around, but we have, I mean, some pretty outstanding mm -hmm. students. I believe so. I think mm -hmm. right now, actually, yeah, we have some students, you know, we have AP and all the different levels. We just, they're all there. They're all, mm -hmm. they all That's work fabulous. So you were at the science fair again this year? Uh, yes, I, mean, I was, okay, yes. You were. Mm -hmm. And then the, the regionals or the mainland nationals, mm -hmm. which one yes. did you go? So I saw the, well, I went to the district fair, yeah. and then um, I got to go to the state fair, and then the international fair. Fabulous, yeah. fabulous. Right. Uh, oh, fabulous. I really, uh, you know, that is, I mean, uh, I was only pulling in shame when I said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the school for girls is, is well known, at least yeah. in, in the science fair circles. Uh -huh. and, and you've been participating for years yes. and years. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. So that's good. So now, <clears throat> you guys are here to talk about steam. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is not having th nothing to do with laundry or, <laughs> no. or anything well, like that. Maybe, maybe we could do like well, a we laundry could do, project. Yeah, a laundry you know, project. We yeah. can make it work. Clothes, fashion. We can make mm -hmm. it work. Yeah. So as they say in, uh, you know, in France, uh, qu'est-ce que c'est que ça? Uh, that means what is yeah. it? Yeah. 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 What, <laughs> what's going on? What is, what's going on with steam? Um, well, I guess I'll go ahead. So yeah, so traditionally we talk about STEM. That's normally. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we've kind of been working together. And we probably likes to really work through our disciplines together because mm -hmm. we think that, you know, you don't go out into the world and say, well, today I'm just going to do Algebra 2. And then somebody asks you a question about politics. You said, not till noon, please. That's not what, you know. So you do everything integrated <laughs> together. So we realized that we have to start working together as a department and as a school and everything. And so then we realized, well, art actually is also kind of one of those things that's always there. So ah, lesson number one, the A in STEAM is for art. art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Write that one yeah, down. There'll exactly. be a test after exactly. this. They're, we'll they're going to administer a test. Uh, <laughs> number two pencils yeah. only, please. Okay, so we're going to, so again, so we brought the art in, and then when we met as a department, or we met as a STEAM group, we had all the science teachers mm -hmm. from all different levels, we all were, were working together, and we realized we were bringing projects of old student work, and we're, we're thinking, wait, 
you've sort of always been doing art. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I mean, the presentation, the aesthetics, the, the delivery always kind of had that A involved. Right. So by bringing that became STEAM. And now we're working towards <laughs> having more of a set curriculum where we can actually bring in all those elements and measure how do we form assessments from them. How do we make sure that the science right. categories are met, but the art categories are also met, but the mathematics is there, or should it just be up to the student? Should the student choose which categories they want to bring in? And Empowerment. Exactly, right. and that's yeah. the best form of learning because yeah. the student, yeah. when they take responsibility for themselves, I mean, it's amazing yeah. the work that mm -hmm. they produce. So, incredible. of what Jasmine has just said, I, mm -hmm. how much of that do you agree with? <laughs> that's a, well, let's, let's hear it. Let's put her on the spot right now. On the record, every 100%. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> could have said 110. <laughs> I could have said, yeah. But um, so I really also believe in um, student directed mm -hmm. um, education, right? And how, what is that? Um, so basically, students um, they decide you know, what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of um, the cheerleaders. Yeah, yeah sort nice of the exactly. in, uh, instructors yeah, rather yeah. than standing in front of the room and just lecturing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a different, a different item, though, because that would apply whether you use A in right. STEAM or not. Absolutely. Right. Um, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. How do you get kids to be self-directed? Um, Self-directed, oh, I love that yeah. term. That's a, that's a term so. out of my college education way back when. Uh, how, what do you do to them? You say, come on, kids, we want you to really get engaged on this. We want you to think like a teacher, think like somebody who's been through the course already, and, and fill in the pukas that you find. What, what do you say to them? I think sometimes, well, one of the strategies I try to use is something called the productive struggle. So I actually have been trying this out, and then you know, a colleague of mine said, hey, this is actually a theory that you've been doing. I'm like, oh, cool, nice. Nice to know I wasn't just making this up. <laughs> so we, I sort of give my students these real-world situations or problems in math, but without giving them the ABC, one, two, three steps beforehand. And then I'm like, just kind of figure it out, guys. Like, here, you have your computer, you have your phones, you have your, you know, we've got, we textbook this this year, but you have all these resources. So it's sort of, they kind of gather the information themselves, and they decide what do they need to learn. What do they need um, to go research? What, what are the skills that they need? Do they need to go across the hall to get the science teacher to assist them or whatever? So it's uh, sort multidisciplinary. Of, right. right. Sort of, it, I started with just mathematics and I started doing like one graph and then it became like a series of graphs or something that got a little more intense. And then they started realizing, well, she's not going to tell us the answers anymore. <laughs> the days of. You made that clear. Yes, I was. Said, yes, uh, exactly. You, you stick by this, right. boys and girls, or mostly girls, I guess. Oh, all girls. All right. girls. <laughs> I, we, don't, we don't teach the problem. Sorry. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all girls. <laughs> But, you know, I'm telling you now, I'm not going to answer exactly. your question. You're going to have to answer your own question. And that's really, truly, like, the mo for me, it was very emotional because I'm sitting there and it's like you're watching your child, you know, trying <laughs> to, to pick up this ball and you just want to go ahead and pick it up for them. Right. And you're like, oh, it's so much better if you do it yourself. Right. And so you try to let the student become responsible and decide what are the skills. Because at the end of the day, if I give them, you know, a formula and they say Y equals MX plus B, here's what M means, here's what B means, but they have their phones now. So when they get into the real workplace, you know, they can they can Google the the, right. the solution. They mm -hmm. can Google the mm -hmm. formula they need. They don't need to be constantly researching, oh, I mean they don't need to memorize it. It'd be nice if they had it, but yeah. it's not essential. Yeah. It's more about where am I looking and what right. skills do I need and do I need to consult, you know, you're working in an office and you have, do I need to go get the law, somebody from the law office to come in and make sure? Do I need to get my boss here? Do I need to get tech support down? So it's finding the people that you need in your mm -hmm. real-life situation to solve the problem that you have. I don't know why, but I, this reminds me of the, the jump from mathematics. Um, you know, this, this is going to be yours, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. um, mathematics, where you, you had to put it down with a pen mm -hmm. and then make a line in a... You know, a little, a, little a, a shade a of multiplication little. sign and a division sign, uh -huh. yeah. and you had to go through the all the calculation in your mind, exactly. number by number. I mean, that's not a thing. Uh, nobody's done no. that in the world, you know, no. for I don't know how many years. <laughs> Absolutely, I have. A, I've, every now and then, I get a call from a friend that says, "Hey, can you just show me how to do long division really quick?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, sure, but what are you doing?" And they're like, "Oh, I'm helping a student." I'm like, "Right, you're not actually using that in your day-to-day -day job. You're just..." helping a student who's helping a student. So it kind of, you kind of realize that a lot of the skills that we're teaching, are they still skills? Hmm. Because are they still things that would be essential? Right. Before we had a calculator, learning how to do four by four digit multiplication is essential. Learning how to do percentages without having an app that <laughs> says, hey, how much was your bill? <laughs> Did you like the person smiley face, yeah. no smiley face? Do we not need that anymore? 
I never promised you a rose garden. This is a hard uh, question. And I'm going to give you the like most essential hmm. response that I that I've always received from my professors. It depends. It depends because <laughs> it depends on the student. It depends on the situation. It depends on the profession they're going to be going into. It depends on what this yeah the, the kid it depends on the kid so I don't think there's necessarily a black or white anymore. right same thing with science too um, you know they still need to know basic science facts mm -hmm. but do you remember what mitosis is probably not right like a picture right and then it went yeah like how they behind and like interface if you didn't remember this you have to write it down also exactly right so but what sticks with you or what should stick with you is the scientific process, the scientific right. method, right? And that way of critical thinking, um, refining your process, uh, making observations, coming up with a hypothesis, that is something that translates to all fields, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. And I think same yeah. thing for mathematics, right? You know, you asked, is that, is that something we still need to do? And maybe not the under, like, you know, getting that answer, because it's a lot faster if you just type it into your calculator. <laughs> but then it becomes, does my answer make sense? Does, you know, a million times two billion, my answer came out to four. Something is wrong. I can see that my finger might have pressed clear well, somewhere along the line, mm -hmm. or I didn't, yeah. you know, something happened. And, yeah. and so they, the, the logical reasoning is essential, but also the process of learning is something that, and they, a lot of schools call it soft skills, mm. which I think is just, not true because it's what, truly what soft skills? so you know perseverance and an ability to complete a problem right. a, a job from start to finish an ability to time manage and do all these things those are the real skills that you use in the workplace mm -hmm. the tools that we provide or any of our other you know colleagues provide are are sort of like the weights that you do in the weight room right so i read this mm -hmm. i can't even remember where i read it but it was when somebody goes to the gym they lift weights and they lift weights and they do all these things, right? And, you know, there's every different reason. But traditionally, you do it so that when you're helping your significant other get their suitcases out of the car, is that you can you actually, do it? I don't know, I'm hoping it is. <laughs> Somebody needs to carry my suitcases for me. That's so not why I do it. Exactly. Oh, you have to see me pack it. Okay, so then they carry, you know, they carry this. And the motion of, of carrying the suitcase out of the car was strengthened by using the weights. But, and like the skills that we learn and the skills that we teach, they're not necessarily about, you know, you walk down the street, here's a number two pencil, can you give me a three by three multiplication? No, it's how to use it throughout your workplace. Yeah. So that's right. kind of where it adjusts. Well, you know, there are people who say that, you know, that's the most important thing. They prepare them for jobs. Some people right. can go to college, some not. I don't agree with that, but, um, you know, and therefore you want to give them the skills that make them immediately marketable right after they yes. graduate mm -hmm. from high school. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm just wondering, I mean, in my old, in my 1960s and 70s world that I live in, um, you know, the science is different now. Math is different. Mm -hmm. When you teach these kids, you're, you've got a whole different program mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. And STEM is what we see, you know, it's like the top of the iceberg, mm -hmm. but there's this whole training kind of you know, philosophy underneath. Um, and I wonder, I mean, my, my exposure to it is the science fair. Mm -hmm. um, so is the science fair something you would find in every corner of the Priory? Does every kid apply? Uh, is it a required course? Is it an after hours extracurricular? Where it's, does it fit in, you know, in your whole program? It's required for certain grades, mm -hmm. but once you get to high school, you can choose to do an academic fair. And one of those is science fair. Right. So. Yeah, for a lot of our high school girls, they're doing science for because they're really passionate about science. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it is an active, you know, a process that you choose to engage in. Mm -hmm. So we do require, I think, for one year. We, yeah, the middle school has changed. Yeah. Now we're, we're opening it up to other fields, history right. day, and, you know, we're moving it around. But still to this day, I mean, it's, it's pretty much mostly a, a decision that they make. And mm -hmm. that alone, that Definitely. value of a student choosing. What's the decision? That they want to take it. It's not mm -hmm. a required thing, you know. So it is required for a little bit. But if they take it for all four years of high school, they've gone three years above and beyond what they need to. So by sometimes students even, they take the project in freshman year, adapt it. And they it, continue it. Yeah, right, and they throughout. adapt it and mm -hmm. they move it along and then they get references and, and you can see the quality of work from freshman mm -hmm. to senior year. And this is them choosing to build yeah. to build on. Mm -hmm. I, I thought girls weren't good at science. <laughs> well, you know what, we kind of are. <laughs> Pretty great, actually. <laughs> Second in our category, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So you know the, the story of uh, what was his name Watson and the double helix, and there was a woman whose name I don't remember right now working with him, and she was the one who actually yeah. right, she's yeah. the one who solved saw the, the problem, and mm -hmm. they didn't give her any credit, and right. it was really awful right. what they did to her. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So I think that wave is changing. I agree. You know, there is a little bit of a lingering bias right. out there, but I feel like men, for the most part, are 
really nice. <laughs> <laughs> they're sensitive. She's they're aware. You better write this <laughs> yeah, down too. Question number three: Men are nice. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna need a minute to cogitate yeah. on that one. So we're gonna take a break. Okay. Yeah. So an hour. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I here at and Yasmin Saban, both uh, teachers, science and technology teachers at the St. Andrews Priory School for Girls. We're going to take a break, cogitate, come right back. We'll have some more for you then. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Texar and Andrew the security guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Seven. Bingo. <laughs> Shouting. <laughs> okay, here we are on Aloha United We Stand. We're talking about why STEAM, S T A M, matters for girls and women. And one of the reasons that you guys are here is because Aloha United Way is somehow involved. How is Aloha United Way involved in St. Andrew's Priory? So we support their educational programs, and I think we just kind of have this ongoing, just a, just a connection and relationship where we, we, you know, we help them and they help us. And so this idea was, let's share some pretty awesome things about mm -hmm. education and let's use this this opportunity to share the great things that we're doing at our school and that mm -hmm. I mean it's mostly them we're just we're just sitting there and you know kind of being like hey thanks good job you're making us look good but it's really them it's really at the end of the day it's about the student mm -hmm. but you know uh, Aloha United we stand uh, they, they collect funding from mm -hmm. the public and other charitable organizations and then they have this big committee mm -hmm. that meets and decides to allocate those funds to specific nonprofits around around the community mm -hmm. with the idea of raising all boats, mm -hmm. the idea of making a better world for Hawaii. Right. And mm -hmm. and also making a better generation come around mm -hmm. next time. Right. That generation. Absolutely. So how does that work in this context? You guys are a private school, aren't you? Yeah, we mm -hmm. are. And um, we do receive um, we do receive some grants from outside um, organizations and we do kind of work through that. But I don't think I think because we're a private school we sort of have a little bit of a a better way to raise our boats because we have more access of what right. we can do and more control of what we can do in our classroom. So with that, you know, we're not running through a lot of red tape. Oh, that's very important, isn't it? Yeah. Gee, if that could only be the case yeah, in every school in the state, Yeah, choosing today, this is what we're doing, right. and I'm like, so is anyone going to check in on that? Like, I, trust me, I know, what, I'm, I'm pretty is sure. Is this okay? Right, we good? Yeah. We good? Is anybody? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then we get to do that, but then it also, you know, it's a, it's, it's a humility factor. You, you, when you do something great, you're like, yes, I did it. When it doesn't go well, you're like, oops. But again, that's what it comes. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So yes, yeah, so we Pick do a little yourself bit up more. Exactly. Yeah, but you guys are. It seems to me you're involved in something very creative. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, at the edge. You're pushing the envelope. You're trying to make a, a learning environment that really works. You're, in a sense, I wouldn't use the word experimenting, but you're, you know, you're inventing new ideas, mm -hmm. and, and that's Sorry. very important. And maybe that's why, um, you know, they like you so much. <laughs> Because, you know, you are contributing to the society by contributing, you know, creative people, mm -hmm. creative thinkers, creative scientists. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I would say uh, inherent in what you're saying is that science is creative. It must be creative. Yes, yes definitely. You, you have yes. to think out of the box, mm -hmm. come up with new ideas. You know. Right. And it's essentially solving a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Science is about identifying a problem and solving it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it, it's a skill that everyone should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by educating your girls in science, they're gonna um, give back to the community and they're gonna flourish in, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Hawaii yeah. and, yeah. So, so I, how did you get into this? I mean, you somewhere in your life, you mm -hmm. decided that you were a science person. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, really, you have to be dedicated to it. It's not just teaching. It's more than teaching if you're teaching science. You have right. to be an expert. Uh -huh. And um, so how, how did that happen for you? Did you have a light come down one day? 
Well, I didn't change your way. You just dropped a sign. You know, when you drop a little basketball in the baby basket, here you go. Well, I've always loved science. Um, my hobbies as a kid was to read, um, like, you know, medical books, and you know, my favorite book was Hot Zone. If you guys remember that. Tell us about it. Um, so the Hot Zone is um, a fictional novel, but it's about Ebola. Um, so it goes into like very graphic detail, but as a as a kid, I was so uh, entranced by that. So science became my passion, and I've always loved biology. So that's what I majored in in college, uh -huh. and um, I had a lot of different mm, career paths and choices along the way. But I found that I really liked teaching, so yeah. I thought, okay, why not combine teaching with my love perfect, perfect. for biology? So, yeah. Why the priory? Well, it's an all-girls school, and um, my husband kind of makes fun of me for this, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a feminist, um, and I believe... There are more feminists <laughs> every day, it seems yes. like. And they're all here, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, and I feel that we, have, we still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. um, to get girls um, into college and into STEM fields and you know just to fight for equality mm -hmm. so i feel that you know being a teacher for an all-girls school is kind of the the best way to do that mm -hmm. yeah nice. how about you jasmine how did you get into it so did you guys know each other before the priory no mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Priory. so i am actually a priory graduate um i went to the priory <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i did science fair um every year in high school um, was really involved in math, um, just really had really great math teachers in high school. And so when I was graduating, I actually was going to go to school for international business. And I showed up my first day. International business. Interna exactly, right. And, so, and I always had this sort of business, business brain and business kind of passion. And I was like, well, that's, you know, let's just, let's just be really rich. So I'm like, oh, let's go visit. And then I'm sitting there my first day of college. It never hurts. Yeah. Maybe it does hurt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm just, you know, hanging out in class. And I'm looking around. And I'm like, wow, this is not what I wanted. And then I get to my calculus class. And my eyes just lit up. And I was like, wait. Oh man, this is really, oh, what have I done? So I called my senior math teacher and I told her, you know, I think I made a wrong choice. And she's like, well, I called it, but I didn't want to tell you because I knew if I told you, you would go the opposite direction. And I was like, you know me very well. So I switched into math immediately, majored in it, loved it, because it really, math for me is sort of, it's sort of like playing an instrument. And when you're doing something, you're, you're in it and you're focusing on what you're doing and anything else that you have going on just kind of sheds away and you're really just in this problem. And then you kind of go to sleep and you know, and then in the morning you'll wake up and you'll be like, wow, I remember the answer to that problem. And it just kind of, it's this thing where it just, it takes over. And I think that passion that I had for education, I wanted to share with somebody else. You know, how, mm -hmm. how musicians share their music. I wanted to share my education passion with, with my students. And yeah. so I just, you know, prior, I called prior the day I graduated. And I said, hey, guys, I need a job. Absolutely. We've got a position for you. So I started. Wow. I started There's an interview process. Yeah, exactly. And they were like, well, you were kind of a great student when we had you. So we're only going to just, we're going to take a chance on you. You know, and it was great. So I started middle school. I moved to the high school. And now I teach the AP Calculus line. Fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Did you great. know if you do an MRI of a mathematician's brain, it's different? Is it really? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, ah, can I call you on that? <laughs> yeah, but it was, it's very, it's, it, was a, it was an interesting process. And it was just, again, it was something that I loved. And, and you know, you, you brought up something that was really funny mm -hmm. was when I was in, in a, as a math major, so I went to school in Canada, in Montreal, and um, I remember it was like my third year, when all when it starts, stops becoming your intro level courses mm -hmm. into your, you know, into the really, the crazy, the crazy mind, mind blowing stuff. And I remember sitting in the room and I, you know, whatever, I walk in, it's, it's freezing, it's like minus 20 degrees outside, and I'm just running into the room. I sit down, I look around for a chair, put my take my coat off, and I sit down, and then I start looking around the room, and I was like, oh. There's not a single female in here. <laughs> I am the only girl. And honestly, I just you cannot I didn't, tolerate this. Right. And I didn't sit in the back row because, you know, because I'm a girl. I sat in the back row because it had enough room to put all my coats. Uh -huh. And then the next day, I made sure to come early and go in the front row. And I did like to participate in the front row. And actually, one of my courses, my, in, my instructor was a female. Mm -hmm. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, you know, and so it's just that that alone just kind of I was okay with it because I came from such a strong background, but I don't know if my students would be. Was there a teacher in I asked the both of you this was there a teacher in your training who had a particularly significant effect on your decision process over this? Yeah, senior year calculus Dr. J. 
Hundred percent. She teaches at the University of Hawaii right now. She's a great instructor. Hope she's watching. Get this link. Mm -hmm. She was amazing, and she gave me the the strength to step in front of the classroom. She would teach me something a little early, and then she would come twenty minutes before class. She would teach me something, and then the next day she would be like, "Okay, go go tell everybody else what you figured out." And I was like, "Well, I don't know. Did I get it right?" And she just starts nodding. And now as a teacher, I'm like, "Oh, she had it lucky. She just gave me the course which I taught right. before." And I'm like, "Wait, I should have thought of that." So yeah, but that hundred percent that would have to be her. How about you, I? Did you have a teacher? Well, well, I've I've, I've had so many great science teachers over the years, and you know um, the common thread that kind of ties them all together is that they're the ones who really made me feel confident about my science skills. Yeah. And I think that kind of instilling confidence in young girls, that's a very key thing. Yeah, right. that Funny we should thing do. is it works the same way with young boys too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you guys a story. <clears throat> you know, one of the big players in the science fair is the Hawaii Academy of Sciences, right. the, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the, the parent organization. Um, I was on the board for that for a while. Oh. Uh, Neil Atabara. Okay. Uh, from uh, Waikale, no, Waikakea High School mm -hmm. uh, in Hilo. <coughs> you know, uh, uh, outer island, neighbor island guy, didn't have much to do with Honolulu. Didn't have much to do with, you know, the big educational institutions mm -hmm. of the state. <coughs> Got involved in the science fair. <coughs> he won the science fair over and over again. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they paid him to go to the Ivy League on a scholarship or something. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he he became a doctor. He became an ophthalmologist, and he wow. now works uh, in his own ophthalmology office and does very well. And um, some people consider him the leading ophthalmologist in the state. And he talks about this process that you just identified about confidence all the time. Mm -hmm. As you know, if if the science fair and his experience winning the science fair hadn't given him the confidence mm -hmm. to think, yes, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can do it here. Mm -hmm. I can compete. I can do it there. I can do it on a national competition. Mm -hmm. I, I got to have some talent here if I can do that. <laughs> uh -huh. That made him feel he could do all the things that he has done. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's why he stays active with the science fair, so he can tell people that. And it's yeah, the same right. thing you identified. Right, that's exactly right. both of the reasons why, you know, that we both identified that instructor. Because when you give that person that confidence, Right, they feel like they can do it, but also it like kind of opens new doors. They're like, exactly. wait, so I just did that pretty right. well. Let's see what else I can tackle. And we do, I do encounter a bunch of students that maybe by giving them confidence in math, you know, they might not become a math major. They might not become a scientist. But then they're like, wait, there are other possibilities. It's okay right. not to be, you know, the perfect student or whatever it may be. Just giving them that confidence in learning alone. Right. Yeah. However you do it. How, Isn't yeah. it true? However you do exactly. it. Exactly. You want the yeah. kid to feel confident. Exactly. So that kind of goes back to the STEAM initiative. So that ties in art with STEM, right? Mm -hmm. So um, somebody who is really interested in art, you know, maybe they will encounter a STEAM project and they'll get to, you know, see that, oh, hey, I'm an artist, but I can also do engineering and science and technology. They're connected. Right, yeah. Right. So it just, um, so art kind of acts as a gateway to the same When fields. we're talking about art, I, w I hope we can define this term, you know, art. in reasonable bounds. <laughs> what is art? We what is art whole... in the context of STEAM? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm. I think we can, I think, I mean, for, for me, one of the things would be delivery and design. Mm -hmm. And and not necessarily, you know, in, we're, again, we're keeping in this context, but more so, you know, when you go into an environment and you go and you're giving a presentation, and I do presentations all the time at conferences or whatever it may be, you're giving a presentation and you, you know, you got some slides up and you got, you know, a bunch of misspelt words, awkward punctuation, mm -hmm. just text heavy. Aesthetically, that's not enjoyable to watch. But if I were to give a presentation where I had, you know, round table discussion and I gave, you know, everybody a thing of play or whatever, we built something and we showed, you know, some law of physics. Mm -hmm. I think that is more engaging for, a, you know, an audience to see. So I think that art component is how do we use visual aspects to True. tie these things together, but also demonstrate and, and design and our project. And stimulate, yeah. exactly. Because and people, engage, people yeah. human beings, think graphically in many ways. I remember they had a program at the medical school, actually the, um, the cancer center, mm -hmm. a few months ago, and it was this guy from Africa. He was brilliant upon brilliant. And he was talking about HIV. It was all focused mm -hmm. at HIV and AIDS. And he was working at the fringe of um, you know, medical biology. 
um, you would have loved it if you were there because he had charts and graphs mm -hmm. that actually demonstrated the most complex biological mm -hmm. processes, a biochemical process mm -hmm. you can imagine. Now, I'm not going to tell you I understood what he was saying, but mm -hmm. somebody who had a little biology, mm -hmm. you know, would understand. Right. And so it, it brings the point that if you take that kind of art, that kind of graphic representation mm -hmm. of these concepts, you make it a lot easier for people to understand right. and run with the ball. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is that the art you're talking about or is it beyond that? Yes, and, it, and I think also um, in the world that we live in, you know, um, there's so much art and engineering, art and technology mm -hmm. together. For example, buildings, architecture, you know, that's all around us. That's art, right? Um, that's functional design. Um, Apple products alone, exactly. I mean, half it's of their marketing, right, is because of the sleek design. And that comes from somebody understanding how to make a very small, you know, drive mm -hmm. fit into this little tiny thing, right. but also make it aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, Apple has taught us that. Yeah. It's like the Museum of Modern Art on right. 53rd Street in Manhattan. I mean, design is, is everything. Design can make you do things. Mm -hmm. It can teach you Absolutely. things. Mm -hmm. Design can, uh, you know, give you, you achievements. Feel. Yeah. So when you say design as part of art, mm -hmm. you're talking about, you know, architecture and engineering. You're talking about pretty much the function of every thing that we have and That's do. Right. Yeah. Makes it pretty interesting for kids, don't you think? Right. Yeah. Which is yeah. Which is why we, you know, we kind of, I kind of mentioned, like, we think that art is being recently added, but it's pretty much everywhere. You right. You know, it's all, mm -hmm. it's everywhere you look. It's all these things do have. There's something you're looking at. Something, right? You're not. I mean, you're closing your eyes and you may be experiencing this thing, or the physics might not actually be there, but the representation of what you're doing has the art to it. It has that factor. So it's always kind of been there. We're just trying to figure out how to make it stay and be clear and more defined right. and, and really format that, that construction of assessment and how can we make sure that all these principles, design principles, engineering principles, mathematic principles are all incorporated so that the student is getting the most out of that, that okay, project. You, well, that's good. You ask your own question. Yeah. <laughs> and when we come back from this break, I'm going to ask, ask you to answer that oh, question. Okay. Oh, no. How <laughs> do you do that? Shucks, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Yasmin Saban <laughs> and I, Hirasuna, of the Priory, uh, the Priory School for Girls. We'll be right back and we'll hear the answer. So oh, it'll be no, good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host a show, Climate Change Beyond Outrage. In it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. See you then. We're back. I told you to come back just like MacArthur, and we came back. How about that? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Despite all the challenges and issues and all that. So, okay, what was the question again? Well, I think I, I was just rambling about something. Um, no, I think we, you know, how do we, well, Sash, we're going to answer it, but I'll pretend I'm you for five seconds. And how do we kind of make that, that STEAM idea stick? Stick. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what's the word? <laughs> Science teacher, help me out here. Stick, exactly. And how do we make it stick in our Stick in the minds of, of stick these Stick in the minds and, yeah, exactly. I'm just thinking of like throwing Play-Doh at the walls right now, you know? <laughs> well, so. one thing you mentioned during the break, which I think is really important, is, is, is the idea of not only trusting high school kids with this kind of responsibility to train themselves, teach themselves, make the inquiring mm -hmm. mind, but also kindergarten kids. Mm -hmm. Why not? They can do this too, right? Mm -hmm. You've found that. You've seen that with your own eyes and your own experience, right? Right. And, you know, for kids, um, there is no separation between science, math, and art, mm -hmm. you know. They naturally put all those things together. Mm -hmm. You know, when they learn about something, they draw it, right? Or they go and ask mm -hmm. their parents. So for them, it's a very natural thing. So all we have to do is sort of encourage that. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a relationship, you know, just to 
connect things up a little, between the notion of uh, making them inquiring, you know, not mm -hmm. giving them the answers, making them search for the answers themselves, think of the questions and mm -hmm. give the, but also the art helps, facilitates mm -hmm. in some way. Can you tell me how that works? Sure. Well, I know that in elementary school, um, they are really big into EDP, which stands for Engineering Design Process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very much like the scientific method. It, it's a process. So they um, identify a problem, um, they look for a solution, they build a model, they test that model. And this is the most important part. I think they refine it, mm -hmm. they evaluate it. So it, it's like a cycle. I iterative iterative mm -hmm. learning. Exactly, yeah. right. So, so where does the computer fit in all of that? I mean, it's, I mean, we did the it iPad is yeah, that was actually be. a really good question. So we had this activity where we did the hour of code, where it's supposed to be that, you know, all students produce one hour of coding or some kind of, you know, throughout that really? week. And it was really cool. We actually did it with our whole school. We got the prep involved, which is our all boys um, K-1-2, and then we got our entire K-12 girls to, to do this activity. And so we thought, well, so should we just give, like, kindergarten boys iPads and just see what happens? <laughs> Are we going to get them back? <laughs> so we actually had my seniors in the AP Calculus and Calculus course, they got the iPads and then they worked with the kids mm -hmm. and they kind of monitored them and then we were thought, okay, well this is kind of cool. And we did that with the, with the one twos. But then we got down to the case and we're like, that's still even kind of a lot. So what we actually did was we, we did an um, activity where we had them design a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, jelly because we had peanut allergies. <laughs> so we did jelly sandwich. So they said, how do you make a jelly sandwich? And the kid was like, put the jelly on the bread. So we had a, a senior helper who literally took the jar of jelly <laughs> and put it on top of the loaf of bread and said, mmm, there's my sandwich. And so we had them walk through the process of what does it mean to code? Step one, step two, or is there step one A, step one B? Mm -hmm. And so there's no computer there, but they're still understand, understanding the principles and they're still understanding the process. And, and they went back and they refreshed and they revisited right. and revised and they did all these things where they can go back and understand how a computer makes mistakes when they make the program and the robot doesn't move. Mm -hmm. Okay, in senior year, yeah, you have to you know work with your robotics team. Right. But in K, it just meant, oh, I forgot I have to open the bag. I gotta <laughs> open the jelly first. So it was really, really that interesting. Very cool. Yeah. So this changes teaching, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, in in so. fact, I mean, you guys are relatively young as teachers. Um, what, what I get, though, is that it's changing even for you since you started doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me about that. I started with the flipped classroom. So it was the idea of giving the content before and doing problems in class. But I was still essentially doing the same thing that a, a, a traditional teacher would do. I was still lecturing, just lecturing them at home and then through videos and then they were just coming back and producing the problem. So it was innovative and in that I was saving time, but I wasn't really doing anything interesting. And so a couple years throughout that, as I started, you know, changing the, my, my way of teaching and getting new courses, I started thinking, well, that's not working because they can still use the phone and they can do all these things. So then I started becoming, what I like to say is sometimes I wear a hat of a lecturer, and then sometimes I wear a hat of a tutor or a mentor mm -hmm. or, a, or a coach or a cheerleader or you know, a counselor sometimes, you know, when it's, when it's really the AP Calculus Day. That's good, so, that's yeah. good. The school is letting you yeah. do that, it's very So good. there's a lot of different things that we can do and we can support our students, but it's no longer I'm standing in front of the board with a whiteboard or a chalkboard and lecturing them. I'm almost, I mean, I'm, I'm engaged. I'm mm -hmm. through, I'm going through the classroom. I'm, I'm sitting on the carpet next to them, yeah. you know, and I'm, we're getting to the problems together. So my role has changed. And I've always kind of been nervous that the computer was going to take over my job. <laughs> you know, I mean, Khan Academy is a great program. And right. I thought, well, that's where education is going. So now I'm terrified, but no. it's not. Because the kids it's the, are taking over your Yeah, I was like, <laughs> exactly. That's what, it, that's what it's become is I just stand there and take attendance and walk out the door, you know. And we work together and I, and I can do these things with them. So my role has drastically mm -hmm. changed. Okay, remember uh, Garrison Keeler? Hawaii Public Radio, National Public Radio, the, the guy who comes from Lake Wobegon, Prairie Home Companion, and he talks about how all the kids are above average. <laughs> Yeah. All the kids are Yeah, we are talked about that in my statistic <laughs> class, and we're like, so, I remember this one girl, she was like, so that's, that's not right, right? And I'm like, add a girl. <laughs> what happened? All the kids are not above average. Right. In fact, there are some really smart kids mm -hmm. and not so smart kids. Mm -hmm. It's the way the world is, the way humanity is. Maybe when we have, uh, you know, uh, genetic designs for everybody, that'd be different. But for now, they're different. Mm -hmm. Right. So what happens, you know, some of the kids are going to get exactly what you're presenting, mm -hmm. you know, the whole new way mm -hmm. of education, of, mm -hmm. of thinking out of the box, of being creative, asking questions, mm -hmm. answering your own questions, collaborating, mold. it's great stuff. 
some kids can't do it as well as others. Right. How do you handle that? I think it should be about hmm. the student themselves, no? Right. And I think it's baby steps, too. Um, so in science, I like to do labs. Um, but doing inquiry-based labs where the students design their experiment themselves, doing that first, that's too much, mm -hmm. right? So I start off with giving them the lab first, and then I say, okay, how would you modify this procedure? And then how would you make your own hypothesis? Mm -hmm. So I feel like those baby steps, that's very important so that everyone can be on board. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys are very important people because the world we live in is increasingly involved in math, science, technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to, you know, grow a generation of people who are not daunted by it, mm -hmm. who are confident that they can do it, who can participate in it, make a good living in it, and it, it requires education, it requires mm -hmm. education of the mind and all that. And I, I just wonder, you know, it's like um, in radio, in the media, you think of the, the people out there who are listening to this, mm -hmm. and in your mind you think of a kind of a Mr. Potato Man person mm -hmm. who is a composite, mm -hmm. and you have everybody has his own kind of vision right. of what right. that listener is like. So I ask you, I turn that question on, what is the ideal graduate like? What is the person you are trying to create here in this process? Can you describe her to me? What is she like? I think for me it would be, it would not necessarily be the student that is capable of getting 100% on every test because really what's the grade for, right? It's again, it's back to those soft skills and it's back to, is this student capable of not only possessing, you know, basic, I'm still going to say there's some basic understanding that we do need, but is that student still capable of of seeking the information they need and understanding what types of information need are needed to fill that void. Because again, there's, I mean, we've heard this a million times before. Half of our students are going to be graduating, um, going into professions mm -hmm. and in all these careers, but the job that they're going to eventually get hasn't even been created yet. So, so mm -hmm. let's say, you know, here's skill one, two, three, great, you've mastered it. Four years later, when you graduate from college, there's now 87 skills, or we've omitted one, two, three altogether. So, by giving them content, I think when we think of ideal student, it's not necessarily about content. It's can the student produce the work they say they're going to produce? Can mm -hmm. they? And if they can't, how do they res like respond to that setback? How do they respond to not having all the materials or or dropping part of their science fair on the way to the right. gym, which I've definitely seen. They freak out and they hold it and they drop. Oh, I just broke my entire project. So okay, let's pick it up and describe that to the judges. So I think there's a lot of different things that these students need to be able to do, but it's not necessarily about content anymore. Yeah. Hi, what do you think? Well, I think my ideal graduate would be confident, um, creative, able to think outside the box, so that way they can find those you know, jobs mm -hmm. that haven't been created yet. Um, they're able to search for their own path. Um, and this is a, kind of an educational, you know, hot word that's been thrown around a lot, but grit, somebody who has grit, that means um, they can make mistakes, but they can learn from them and mm -hmm. yeah, try yeah. again. So I think those skills are very important. And you guys time. have to stay up with it. In other words, whatever, you can't be locked in, you can't be a snapshot. You've got to be mm -hmm. a, a movie that changes all the mm -hmm. time. Exactly. And you've got to be up on your, your, your developments and your science mm -hmm. and your math and your technology so you can open their minds to that. But well, that's setting an example for them, right? Showing that we respond to things that change right. and that right. we are going to adjust. Maybe that's the biggest teaching point yeah. of all. Yeah. <laughs> it changes, you change, right. they right. change, exactly. we all change. Well, just, uh -huh. just get used exactly. to change. <laughs> and we are also going to evolve right now. Yes. I, Hirasuna, a science instructor, and Yasmin Saban, math and technology instructor, both from the St. Andrews Priory School for Girls. You are a credit to the school, both of you. Thank you so Thank much you for so coming. Much Thank you so much for having us. Yes. <laughs>